What a beautiful Lord's Day. Wow. Good to be able to share in the beauty of God's creation. Uh, I know that uh, my daughter's freezing. She thinks it's winter already. It's not, but uh, just a beautiful time of the year. And it's good to see all of you today. If you have been away and have just coming back, or if you're a visitor this morning, we're really glad you're here. I hope you'll keep on coming. Uh, you know, you, you get out of something what you put into it. And so I would encourage you to put your life uh, into the church and, and to grow and to continue to share together. Uh, it's good to be able to be together. Now this morning, First Christian, I want to invite you into an adventure. Uh, have, you ever, have, have you ever gone on a real adventure? I mean, not the normal things that we might do, not even a normal vacation, but something that was, that was just different, something that was outstanding, something where you just remember it. It was an adventure. Back several years ago, uh, our son decided he wanted to go on an adventure. Now, he was married, uh, had, uh, I think, the first grandson had already been born, and he decided he wanted to go skydiving, and he did. But he didn't tell Judy and I about it until after he had done it. I think he probably understood we would not be pleased with him going on that adventure as a married man with a child, but he did it anyway. It was an adventure. Now, maybe skydiving is not a good example for most of us here because probably most of us here are not interested. I'm not sure God intends for us to jump out of an airplane anyway. But the adventure that I'm inviting you on is something that God wants us to do. It's really what the church is made for. It's what we're all about. Why does First Christian Church of Morristown exist? What's it here for? For your comfort? for your happiness? Uh, if you were with us back in February when we first started here, I raised an issue that you need to decide. Are you going to be, as a church, like a cruise ship or like a rescue boat? I still am asking that question. Uh, some people see the church as a cruise ship. It's to meet all of my needs. It's to help me to have a wonderful trip through life. But Jesus sees the church more like a rescue boat. It's here to bring people into a life-changing transformation with Jesus Christ. There's a song. I'm going to read the words to you. You probably will know it as soon as I start. Among the local taverns, there'll be a slack in business. Because Jesse's drinking came before the groceries and the rent. Among the local women, there'll be a slack in cheating because Jesse won't be stepping out again. They baptized Jesse Taylor in Cedar Creek last Sunday. Jesus gained a soul and Satan lost a good right arm. They all cried hallelujah when Jesse's head went under because this time he went under for the Lord. The scars on Jesse's knuckles were more than just respected. The county courthouse records tell all there is to tell. The pockets of the gamblers will soon miss Jesse's money, and the black eye of the law will soon be well. They baptized Jesse Taylor in Cedar Creek last Sunday. Jesus gained a soul, and Satan lost a good right arm. They all cried hallelujah when Jesse's head went under, because this time he went under for the Lord. From now on, Nancy Taylor can proudly speak to neighbors. Tell them how much Jesse took up with little Jim. Now Jimmy's got a daddy, and Jesse's got a family, and Franklin County's got a lot more man. They baptized Jesse Taylor in Cedar Creek last Sunday. Jesus gained a soul, and Satan lost a good right arm. They all cried hallelujah when Jesse's head went under, because this time he went under for the Lord. You know what's sad? Some churches never see that. Because they never reach out to the Jesse Taylors. As a matter of fact, they may even live in such a way that the Jesse Taylors don't feel welcome. I heard the story a preacher told of a woman that he had witness to who uh, had really lived a, 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 a rough, dirty, immoral life. And she had come to the end of her rope. She realized she had to make some changes. And somebody had said to her, well, have you tried the church? And she said, why would I want to do that? They would only make me feel worse. See, folks, the problem we live in today is that people all around us are going to hell and nobody's ever told them there's a different place they can go to. 
People all around us are carrying buckets of guilt and nobody's ever told them about the grace of God. People all around us are ruining their lives and nobody has ever taken the time to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. You understand, people can be changed. There can be transformation. Now, this morning, we're going to be looking at the book of Colossians. And I want to read to you about some people who have been transformed. Now, it's in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Paul writes to Christians, and he talks about their transformation. Listen to verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Verse 22. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Now that kind of transformation doesn't just happen. It takes the work of God in the church and the work of the church for God to do something to help people come to the place that they can understand what life in Jesus Christ is really all about. And when there is a church who has a desire to reach the Jesse Taylors of this world, that's a church you can trust. Because you know you can bring your family and friends. You can bring your hurting people and your lost people. You can bring them because you know that kind of church is interested in their soul, interested in their eternity, interested in their life. You can trust the church to transform lives when the church has its desire to see lives transformed. So what does it take for that to happen? Well, I said we were going to look at the book of Colossians. Uh, in the first chapter, Paul, as far as we know, who had never been to the church, writes to these Christians, and he says some things that uh, I think we can draw some lessons from. Colossians 1, verses 3 through 6. Paul addressing Christians. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that, you've all, and, and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you all over the world. This gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You see, I believe the church is meant to impact lives, but let me talk to you about how that happens. The church impacts lives, number one, when the church has an evident faith. A church, the church, impacts life when the church has an evident faith. Paul writes in that passage that we read, Colossians 1, he says, we have heard about your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, what do you think he heard? Well, we heard about their faith. Well, what did he hear? What, what do you mean, what did he hear? You, you see, faith is evident. There was something about these people, about the way they lived, about their life, that gave an indication to Paul that they were in Jesus Christ. And what we're talking about, evident faith, we're talking about the reality of the fact that if we are relationship with Jesus Christ, that's going to show in our lifestyle, in our words, and in what we do. In the second chapter of Colossians, verses 6 and 7, the Apostle Paul says this, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. I've used this illustration a lot of times because one of my favorite stories of one of the miracles of Jesus. You remember uh, the Gospel of Mark really records it where Jesus is teaching and the house is packed with people and, and there's a guy who's a paralytic. And he has four friends. And they bring this man on a stretcher to Jesus. Can't get in. House is packed. So what they do. Well, you remember the story. They crawl up on the roof. They tore a hole in the roof. And they lower the man down because they wanted to get their friend to Jesus. Let me ask you something. Have you torn up any roofs lately to get your friends to Jesus? A little embarrassing, maybe. It's a little risky. Is Jesus going to be able to do anything? But you see, these four friends cared so much, and apparently there was something about them that impressed Jesus because it says when Jesus saw their faith, he saw their faith. What did he see? He saw them tearing up a roof and bringing their friend to him. 
And so I understand that the church is meant to live out in such a way that people can see in us what it means that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Those are not just words. James says in James chapter 2, verse 18, But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, I will show you my faith by what I do. And so church... Please understand that when people around you individually or around the church, when they begin to see actions that come from faith, that draws people. When people begin to see a church that's, that's moving, that's doing things, it's not a question of the size of the church, it's a question of the size of the faith. And when people begin to see that, that draws people, and people begin to understand that there's something here, there's something that's different. And that's when lives begin to be transformed. What you do as a church should happen because of who you are. Paul, again, talking to the church at Colossae, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, says, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So uh, the church impacts lives when the church has an evident faith. Number two, the church impacts lives when the church practices sacrificial love. When the church practices sacrificial love, Paul says to the church at Colossae, we have heard about your faith and love for all the saints. You see, faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior must produce in us love for all of Jesus' people. And it's in the church that we really learn what love is all about. Because you see, it's when you come to church and when you get involved in church that you begin to learn more about how to care for each other and how to love each other and how to be kind to each other and how to put others before ourselves, how to live in an unselfish way, a sacrificial way. And it's when the church practices that kind of love that people begin to see something different than the rest of the world. Uh, you who know your Bible well are probably thinking ahead of me just a little bit. To the words of Jesus in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, he said, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, notice that, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So in the church we come together and we practice sacrificial love here, which helps equip us to go out into the world and practice that kind of love out there. But it begins to draw people because that kind of love is attractive, loving like Jesus loved. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen, does it? Unfortunately, those of us who have been in church for a long time get kind of set in our ways. Can you imagine that? We kind of get used to same old, same old, and we want to kind of keep old, same old, same old. We, Judy and I talked to a preacher here a while back, and he was telling us about one of his first ministries and what it was like. He was preaching at this small church. and said a woman came up to him and said to him very nicely, young man, you can do whatever you want here as long as nothing changes. <laughs> he knew what would happen to that church, and he wasn't a prophet, but he was correct. It just is dying slowly. I know of a church in Illinois was not too far from where we are. It's not there anymore. They don't meet anymore. It was a Sunday morning and a family came in. They had been there before. They were first-time visitors and they walked into the worship center. Kind of like this one, although not quite as long. And They sat down and somebody came up and tapped them on the shoulder and said, I'm sorry, you're sitting in my seat. You'll need to move. They never went back again. See, faith is shown by our actions, but our actions must be motivated by love. To come to the place that understand that what we do, what we say, how we treat people, whether we give up our seed or not, may have something to do with somebody's eternal salvation. That's a pretty big responsibility, folks. But it's also a great adventure. To know that God will work through people when we are faithful to him to accomplish his will of being, being about the transformation of lives, bringing people into a relationship with him. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, Therefore, as God's chosen people, that's, he's writing to Christians, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other 
And forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. I, I, I love the account that uh, Rick Russo tells in his book, The Externally Focused Church. I may have told you this, because it was one of those things that just kind of stuck in my mind. Uh, they, they, uh, their church uh, had decided that they were going to adopt a local school. And uh, so they began to work in that school. They would go in and uh, they would clean up, because the janitorial staff couldn't get it all done. They would clean up. Uh, they did some things for the teachers, had some special events. Uh, they kind of worked around the yard a little bit, just doing physical labor around that particular school. One of the teachers responded, if this is what Christianity is all about, I'm interested. Now, do you understand, folks, that when, when the church gets outside the walls of the building and practices that kind of love out in the community, people begin to see and begin to take notice. Because you see, what they're seeing, when they look at that, they're seeing Jesus. Jesus. They're seeing Jesus lived out in his body, the church. And the church can really impact lives when it practices that kind of sacrificial love. Yes, within the church, but also outside of the building. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So the church impacts lives when it practices sacrificial love. Number three, the church impacts lives when the church lives in hope for the future. The church impacts lives when it lives in hope for the future. Now, now I want you to notice what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1. He's talked about, we, we've seen your faith, and, and we've heard about your faith, and we've, we've heard about your love. And then he says, uh, in verse 5 of Colossians chapter 1, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel. You see, here's what happens when we begin to understand the end of the story. We, we know the end of the story. The rest of the world doesn't. We know the end of the story. We know who wins in the end. We know that. And so what that does in us, it develops a greater sense of faith and a greater sense of love because we know that God is at work in his church. God is at work transforming lives. God is at work today. And when we begin to understand that, then we live in a hope for the future. In the midst of the mess that's going on around us, folks, we've got good news. We know that God is still at work. And we know victory's ours. It may take a while to get there. But that kind of hope for the future transforms the present. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Now that phrase, alive in Christ, is something that we call eternal life. I hope you understand eternal life doesn't just mean heaven. Eternal life begins the moment you come into that relationship with the living Lord. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And we begin to understand that even though there's still pain and struggling, even though there's still difficulties in life, even though life doesn't work out like we want, we've got this hope for the future that makes a difference in our life in the present. And because when we have that hope in the future, it causes us to, to believe even in a greater way in the power of the Lord and in his work to transform lives. You see how hope changes us? We, we can look at people that we know who are just made a mess of life. And we believe that God can recreate that life. We can look at people who just uh, are in total rebellion against God, don't even believe in God, and we know that Jesus Christ can save them. And we believe that the Holy Spirit still convicts and still transforms and can produce in the worst life a new life in Christ. Do you see how that changes the church? All of a sudden we begin to understand we have a mission 
We have a mission that's good for our world. It's, it's easy. It's real easy for us to complain about all that's going on in the world. It's a little harder for us to get our hands dirty and out ministering to people, caring for people, sharing the good news of the gospel, helping people to understand that there is transformation and to be able to see the Jesse Taylors of this world come into a new relationship with Jesus Christ because we want to pass on to them that hope for the future. Uh, there's a little phrase that Paul uses. It's in Colossians chapter 1. Verse 27, he talks about the mystery that's been revealed to the Gentiles, and he says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is, and I here's the phrase, Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's that message, Christ in you. Because you're in a relationship with him, you are in Christ, and Christ is in you, and now there is this hope of glory. It's important. It's important that we understand not only that Christianity impacts us now, but it impacts us for the future. You know, I had to change something back, this has been a good many years ago, long before any of you knew me. Uh, I had to change something that I said in a sermon a couple of times. I made a comment in a sermon that uh, I believe the Christian life was the best life even if there wasn't a God. Now, you understand what I was saying. I wasn't saying there wasn't a God. I was saying that I believe that the moral standard, the excellence of the Christian life, is the greatest life, even, even, even if this thing about the gospel is not true. And then I read the Bible. <laughs> uh, I get in trouble sometimes when you don't read your Bible. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if only in this life we have hope in Christ, we're to be pitied more than all men. See what Paul was saying? If, if, if all we've got is the Christian life and there's nothing beyond this, we're, it's, it's a pitiful state. And so I believe what transforms the church is when we have this view of the future. Everybody's not going to heaven, folks. And we have the heavenly message. Everybody's not saved and we have the salvation message. And it's when we begin to understand that and we live with this hope of the future that we can begin to impact people around us because we want them to know the joy of hope. We don't live in despair. We live in hope. We don't live in depression. We live in hope. We don't live in defeat. We live in hope because of what God has done for us in Christ. Number four, the church impacts lives when the church lives and proclaims the gospel. The church impacts lives when the church lives and proclaims the gospel. The gospel, of course, you understand the word gospel means good news, but it means more than that. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and he rose again. There's the good news. And it is that full message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he did, that transforms lives. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And we begin to understand that a church is meant to proclaim the good news, not just among ourselves, but to proclaim the good news to people that we know. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1 verse 6 in talking about this gospel, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. The gospel is bearing fruit. What, what, what's the fruit? What is produced by the proclamation of the gospel? Souls who are transformed, lives that are changed. And we begin to understand that the church has a responsibility to live out the gospel, that is, live as followers of Jesus Christ, put our faith into action, love people, share that good news of the gospel, live in hope for the future, and understand that then fruit is produced, that is, souls come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's what the church is all about. Now, there's an old story of a fellow who was taking a tour of one of the old cathedrals in England. And the tour guide was talking about all of the massive architecture and the age of the building and how it was built and who's buried in the crypts and all of this. And somebody from the back of the room shouted, but has anybody gotten saved here lately? It's a good question. It's a good question because that's really our mission. Fred Craddock, a wonderful preacher of the gospel, a graduate of Johnson Bible College, 
I told a story, I may have shared it with you, but it's worth sharing again because it gets close to home. Fred Craddock was a student at Johnson uh, during uh, World War II. And uh, he was doing a student ministry in Oak Ridge. Of course, you know the story about the secret city and how much Oak Ridge grew unbelievably. All kinds of people, the government bringing in for the Manhattan Project. Well, this country church, this little, not country church, this little church, began to discuss what was going to happen with all these new people coming into town. And so they actually had a congregational meeting, Fred said, and they revised their bylaws and they added this requirement for church membership. You have to be a property owner in Oak Ridge to become a member of our church. Now, now you know what that was. That was a barrier to keep people out, new people. Fred Craddock said it was some years later he was back in Knoxville and he decided to visit that little church and he remembered where it was and he drove by and said that's now a barbecue stand in the church building. It's no longer a church. I, I understand why that happened. When the church stops being the church, God allows it to stop being the church and it might as well become a barbecue stand. You see, our responsibility is to support missions, yes. Our responsibility is to send people out, yes. Our responsibility also is to live it where we are, each of us individually doing that which God has called us to do. This is not just about the preacher. This is about all of us. You, I, we are all ambassadors for Christ. Now, you may remember, again, back in February, when I first came, I asked all of you if you had a one. And I'm going to ask you again, do you have a one? What do I mean by that? I think every one of us needs to have at least one person who is on our heart and in our mind and in our prayers because they're away from God. Can be somebody who's fallen away. Can be somebody who's become lukewarm. Can be somebody who's in total rebellion. Could even be an atheist, whoever it is. Could be a family member, a friend. Maybe somebody who doesn't even live close. But have that one person that you pray for daily that God will put a Christian close to them or that you will be able to say something to them that will help bring them in. That's living the gospel. That's proclaiming the gospel. And pray that that person will come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And then if there's somebody who lives close, invite them to come to church with you. Say, I'll pick you up. And let's meet for breakfast. We'll have a good breakfast. Then we'll go and we'll share in church together. Come on, let's Let's go. And it's amazing when you do that, how often God begins to move. You know, I've heard statistics that non-believers, by a large percentage, would attend church if somebody would invite them. Now, who's going to do that? Well, that's your ministry, Christians. I like the way Dr. Tony Evans says that when you got out of the baptistry, you got into the ministry. You may not do it in a full-time situation like I've done for years, but maybe like I'm doing it now, kind of really part-time. But it's your ministry. In Colossians chapter 4, Paul writes to the Christians, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too that God may open the door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. There's a good prayer. Pray for each other. Pray for me. Pray for your leaders. Pray that we might declare the message clearly so that people might come to this transformation of life. So what do you do? What's this all about? See, I think we need to be in a situation, all of us, if we're going to be a part of First Christian Church of Morristown, that we trust this church enough so that we can bring our family and friends, even broken, hurting, lost people. People maybe we don't even know that we invite off the street. That we can trust that when they come here, they'll be welcomed and loved. That when they come here, they'll hear the truth of the gospel. That when they come here, they'll be pointed to Jesus Christ. When they come here, there will be the working of God in their life to bring them into a living relationship that will transform them from hell to heaven. You can trust a church like that. And so, as I get ready to close, I want to read from Colossians 1, 
for you. I've done this before. I think I used Ephesians before. This time I want to do it from Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 9, Paul tells about what he prayed. So I'm going to pray this for you. Colossians 1, verses 9 through 12. For this reason, since the day we heard about First Christian of Morristown, we've not stopped praying for a First Christian and asking God to fill First Christian with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that First Christian may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that first Christian may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified First Christian Church of Morristown, Tennessee to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. If we live right and God answers that prayer, this will be a church people can trust. And it will be a place where the Jesse Taylors of this world will find hope and life and a wonderful relationship with Christ and his people. What do you do? Who's your one? Who's your one that you're praying for, that you're inviting? that you're hoping with all of your heart that they'll come to know Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your church. I thank you for a church like Colossae that uh, even though it was not perfect, had difficulties, still you worked and lives were transformed. I thank you for this place. I thank you for the history of First Christian and for all of the good things that have happened in the past, but Father, that's in the past, we have now. And I pray for the continual guidance of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that everyone who's a part of this church might understand what you will do in the life of the church when the life of the church is for you. May lives be transformed in Christ's name.